Dan, the president veering from advisor to advisor, idea to idea, what does it all reveal about President Trump? I think what we've seen this week, um, and we've had wild weeks before, but there is something particular about this week in the way he went back and forth. I mean, you used the word pinballing in the, in the opening. I think that's a very good description of it. There is a sense that he doesn't know his own mind. He doesn't know what message he wants to put out. And he doesn't know, other than fighting with China, what kind of policy he really wants. So on the one hand, one day he will say, we are looking at tax cuts. The next day he will say, we are not. One day he will say, the economy is as great as it could be. The next day he's attacking the Federal Reserve chairman, saying the economy should be better and he's holding it back. So. Um, I think this was a week in which he was the main driver of lack of confidence and instability uh, in the economy. And, and that, that is a worrisome thing as the rest of the world and corporate executives try to figure out what they want to do about the future. Martha, on that point, the rest of the world, as the president flies to France and prepares for the G7, what do global leaders see in this president this week? I, I, I think exactly what Dan just described that the and, and you described and it to the trade war he's coming into this meeting I don't think he ever really wanted to go to this meeting it's his third meeting I don't think he was too enthusiastic about it and now we really can't go in there and brag about the US economy if they can bring up all these other things in the stock market and then back and forth and back and forth but I think world leaders are worried I mean, this does not, this isn't just about the U.S. economy. This is about the global economy, and he's about to go smack in the middle of it. Is there going to be a collective response at the G7 to the global slowdown, or is this America alone? I, I think there, you know, there has to be some sort of global response in some way, whether it will do any good. You know, I talked to Peter Navarro last, last Sunday about that, and he ticked off all these things that are going to happen in, the, in the, some sort of global response, and then this will happen in the trade. But there were a lot of ifs in that, and, and so far they're not coming through on those. Global leaders are rattled by the trade war. So are the U.S. markets and the investors. Should they buckle up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, po policy uncertainty is a thing that uh, we've heard for a long time, holds back investment. When you talk to CEOs about, well, where am I going to make that next dollar uh, invested, where am I going to build that next plant, they want to know what the rules of the road are going to be. That's why we have an international trading system. And the president has really tossed a lot of chaos into that. Um, it's absolutely true right now that global trade uncertainty is like six times larger than it normally is, that uh, the president has uh, gone out and um, basically every day with the tweets made it possible that the tariff rates will change on China. If you're, if you're like a retailer in America trying to figure out where you're going to source you know, that next shoe, you need to know if there's going to be tariffs next week or if there's going to be tariffs next month and what, and what rate they might be. And no one has any confidence in that. And the president himself seems to not actually know what he wants other than to win. And so while we wait to see what victory might look like, the economy really is slowing down. And that is the backdrop of all of the, the pinballing, as, as you all put it, that we've seen this week. Anita, Martha brought up Peter Navarro, the White House trade advisor. When you're at the White House talking to your White House sources, and they're explaining what happened this week. Who do they say is in charge? Well, we do hear a lot about Peter's name. I mean, we hear over and over that he's impacting the president, influencing the president. Other aides are not on board with this, right? I mean, he did have a meeting today, and the Treasury Secretary called into that. He met with his uh, trade advisor, Robert Lighthizer. But, but all everybody I'm talking to is saying it's about Peter Navarro. And, but really, it's about the president, right? He doesn't really know what he wants to do, but I think you have to take a step back and look at where he's coming from. This is the economy was the thing that he always had in his pocket for his reelection. He, he veered off to 20 other topics, but it was always there as the thing that was going to get him through the election. And he's just really starting to feel like it's not going to happen. Larry Kudlow, the national economic advisor, you mentioned Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. Whether it's Navarro, or President Trump, is anyone countering them 
in terms of argument inside. It really feels like to me that the first year or so, there were more people in the White House that were pushing back at the president, and now it's a little bit less so. I remember when they were, we were talking about terrorists, when he threatened terrorists for Mexico, remember a few months ago, and everybody was saying, well, there's no one in the White House that, nobody wanted that, nobody wanted it, but no one really wanted to tell him that either. Yeah. But what does the president want? But he's so clearly concerned. I mean, they can say we're not concerned, we're not concerned, and all you had to do is watch this wild week. And knew, and know how concerned Donald Trump is about it, and he may not be getting any pushback on the economy itself, but politically, they know this could be big. What is trouble. he concerned about, though, Martha? Is it about just the economy, or is it his own reelection in 2020? I, well, I think both, because they're they're tied together very, very closely. I mean, surely he's worried about the economy as well, uh, but politically, it it could be pretty disastrous if the economy tanks. I mean, you you see him blaming others, and and Donald Trump does that a lot. It, it's not my fault. It's the media's fault for for wanting a recession. He claims it's someone else's fault that this happened. It's Jerome Powell's fault. So he's in that sort of blame game, which which is an indicator. You know, he's very worried. What does the president want here, though? Just to go on what we were just talking about with Martha. Does he want? economic war and political war? Is that his message for 2020? Or is he really seeking a deal with China? Does he want to pass the USMCA? Well, he, he wants the USMCA, the, the trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. He wants to be reelected. Um, and as Anita said, uh, the economy has been his strongest calling card. Lowest unemployment rate in half a century. Um, stock market at various times doing very, very well. Um, other indicators of continued growth. It is, there are signs on the horizon of slowing and perhaps worse, we don't know. Um, all of that puts at risk his political future. Um, the other thing we know about him is he wanted to have a fight with China. Um, he, he has talked about that predating his arrival on the political stage, that he felt that we were being taken advantage of in trade agreements, and he wants to go after China. The problem is he's gone after a, an adversary that's proved as tough and as wily uh, as he is, and there seems to be no way right now that there's a simple solution to this. And, that, want, and, yeah, that, and that's the real risk for him. He wants the Federal Reserve to give him a rate cut. Absolutely. No, he really does believe that the Fed's policies are holding back growth. And, and it, we are not growing anywhere close to as fast as he promised that we would after the tax cut. He said at least 3%, maybe 4 maybe 5 We will be lucky to hit 2.5% growth this year. And it could be a lot worse if the slowdown uh, deepens. But just to build off what Dan was saying, I think the president really has a different view of the global economy than really any of his predecessors since World War II. He believes that when other countries do well, America does poorly. And he, he needs to defeat them almost in economic warfare. That's, that's what he wants with China. He wants to bring American companies back from China, in a, which is a totally different way of looking at the world than business executives have seen for the last 20 years, where they see China as this place we want to sell into, a place where we can source cheaper products. What's driving China in President Xi Jinping? Well, well, I, I, I think one of the things you see here, and, and you can look at President Trump and say, boy, he, maybe he was right about this in the beginning. Maybe we are being taken advantage of. But starting this trade war with Wiley China, I, I, China is just coming right back at him. And, you know, today, looking at that, okay, they're going to do that, I'm going to take it up to 15 percent then, you just have to say, where does this end? And I don't think China has a plan for where this ends, and it doesn't look like we have a plan exactly for where this ends. The other aspect yeah. of this is that the, uh, the, the president has done this without any support from allies. Um, that's, that is a major criticism, certainly from the Democrats, but from, from others, that, and including allies, that he's done things to push allies away at a time when a more united front might have more impact on China. We don't know that because we, we are not seeing that right now, but that's an element of it, that it's, you know, it's America alone, and so far it has not worked. Where are yeah. the Republicans, Anita? Yeah. Where's the business community? Are they pressuring the White House? The business community, Chamber of Commerce, retailers, farmers, and all the people they represent said today they didn't like this. What They were frustrated with China, but that he shouldn't go this route, and he went this route. But, you know, when I go to rallies, Trump rallies, and when I talk to Trump supporters, I know we've been saying this for a couple years, 
but the number one thing that they say is not about immigration, it's not about the economy, it's that he's out there fighting for them, and they love it. They eat it up, and they're going to eat it up and love this until perhaps the economy does go down. And so they, they, you know, they say, it's okay he didn't get a deal with China because other, other presidents would have stopped, and he's, he's going at it. What's the reality then, Jim, with this economy? There is a trade war. The markets are up. They're down. But what's the reality of the economy? The reality is we're still growing. We're doing better than most of the rest of the developed world. But we're slowing down. Growth was slower in the last quarter than it had been the quarter before. It's not projected to be great in the next quarter. And as the world slows down, we are at risk of catching sort of that almost recessionary fever, if you will. And I think that's the big worry is that these trade moves could be disastrous to business investment, which is already kind of plummeting. And if we see more of it, you could see an actual pullback uh, uh, in the American consumer, which has been really carrying the recovery. And if they stop spending money, then growth really could turn south. Does this change the Democratic race for president? I don't know whether it changes the Democratic race for president. I mean, certainly they don't want to talk about the economy every single second of the Democratic race. That's not what that's about. They don't want to be. They don't want to be seen as look. We're we're hoping for a recession so Donald Trump will lose. They don't want to be in in that. But I do think this is an issue, unlike many others, unlike immigration, unlike North Korea, unlike foreign policy, where people may not feel it, if the economy softens and, th and things turn bad, they will feel it. They may, if, if they don't live in a border state, they may not really pay attention to immigration and just say, well, the president's fighting for us. This is the kind of thing that could really change things. This is, for Vice President Biden, is this part of the reason Democrats continue to rally around him in poll after poll. He's at least the leader. Senator Warren's been catching up. Is it because Democratic voters are looking for seasoned hands amid all of this instability? I think that's part of it. I mean, obviously, he's played and played very hard this week the electability card, <clears throat> even so far as in an advertisement touting his standing in the polls as being better than any other Democrat to go against President Trump. Um, but the other element that he's pushing, uh, both explicitly and implicitly, is I can go in on day one. I know what to do. I've, I've, I've got lots of experience. I've seen it up close. I've dealt with these issues over 40 years, whether in the Senate or as the vice president to Barack Obama. Um, you can count on me to bring stability to a chaotic world. And I think that that, in the long run, is why there are a number of people who, you know, if they're, even if they're not wildly enthusiastic about him, seem to have, for now, and I say that for now, gravitated toward him.